If you're a medical doctor wanting to publish in high impact medical journals, then this video is for you. Listen, a lot of clinicians want to publish because they recognize the career benefits it can bring them. It can unlock promotions. It can get you invited to high profile speaking events. It can plant a flag and establish yourself as a world leading expert in an area. Not to mention, you can make a real world impact, a real difference on your clinical field and on the patients who you want to help. But so often I see doctors get stuck before they even get started. Life gets busy. You've got a lot of clinical demands. And let's face it, there's a lot of new skills around research and writing that you may not have because that's not what you do day in and day out. But don't worry, in this video, I'm gonna share with you a step-by-step -step structured roadmap designed specifically for my experiences working with dozens of clinicians that can help take you from your zone of genius, which is real clinical insight and experience, to publishing in high impact medical journals fast. I'm Professor David Stuckler, and I know a thing or two about publishing. I started my career at Yale School of Medicine and later became a professor at Harvard School of Public Health. I created the Fast Track Med program that builds on my insights, having published over 400 papers in peer reviewed journals, including dozens, literally dozens, in the Lancet and the dozens in the British Medical Journal. I created the Fast Track Med program to help doctors, nurses, and other healthcare professionals bridge that gap from idea to publication. If you're interested in exploring, if you could be a good fit for a Fast Track Med Inner Circle program, click the link below, apply, let's get on chat and see if you can be a good fit. The first step in your publishing roadmap is to define your goals. We need to establish clarity on exactly what you want to achieve with your research. For some of you, this goal can be about really shaping the field. It can really be about influencing the right people to change medical practice to affect guidelines and how things are done. That's an amazing goal, but that goal may not mean you have to publish in the New England Journal of Medicine. It could mean that actually the right journal is a specialist journal where you're speaking directly to your audience that's going to get you invited to the right conferences and networks to really start amplifying your visibility and impact. Others of you maybe are trying to get to the right residency program, or maybe you're trying to transition to a hemidoc path where you might work half your time as a clinici clinician and do some really stimulating research on the side um, and maybe get in partnerships with pharmaceutical companies or do consulting. In that case, you might need the extra prestige of some of the top of the top creme de la creme medical journals. And then we do need to target the lances. We do need to target the New England Journal of Medicine. But if you don't have clarity on your goals and what it's really about, um, you can feel rudderless and lost at sea. Let me tell you about Dr. Bakula. Uh, she's half Greek, half American pediatrician. She had been really concerned about long COVID and the risk it was creating to diabetes in children because she had been seeing more and more of that manifest in her clinic. And she wanted to share her clinical insights to influence guidelines in Europe on how this was being handled, detected, because she felt a, a lot of it was being misdiagnosed and misidentified. Um, so with her, we crafted out a specific plan that involved getting her on stage for an oral presentation, which we achieved, at one of the leading conferences in her field in Europe that coincidentally happened to be held in Athens. And from that, um, a smooth path to publishing. Actually, at that conference, she was able to network directly with the editors of the medical journals uh, and kind of open up the goal so she had a very smooth ride to publication, even on something that might have been seen as a medical hypothesis or something quite really innovative that was outside of the mainstream of what was commonly being discussed. But by first getting clarity about your goal and your roadmap, it's going to help us as we move to the next step. We always want to stay focused on really that North Star so that we can optimize a path for you. Second, in your roadmap, you need to identify your main resources and also your constraints. And you got to be realistic with yourself. So for example, right, if you're working on your own and you don't have a team, clinical trial is probably going to be out of the question. If you've never done research before, I don't recommend, and if you don't have statistical know-how, I don't recommend diving deep into a sophisticated epidemiologic inverse probability weighting modeling design. It, it just is not really going to be the right fit for you. You just don't have the time to go master those skills. Now, you can partner up and bring somebody on your team, and we do have doctors who, who've done that working with us. But generally, if it's your first publication, I recommend going for some low-hanging fruit and staying with skills that are already in your wheelhouse. What I, I typically recommend is real-world evidence. And so this 
is really around powerful pieces of medical evidence that can shape policy and practice. And so they are important and help you to really establish yourself as an opinion leader, a thought leader in that space. And those are really kind of the, the two tools that are accessible to people who really have might not even have any experience doing research at all. And those are systematic reviews and pragmatic trials. I have a preference for systematic reviews because, again, if it's your first paper, uh, uh, some of you in medicine will be familiar with the evidence hierarchy where right at the top of the evidence hierarchy that you go from maybe a, a medical case report to maybe a prospective study or cohort study to an experimental design, maybe unblinded through to a blinded randomized control trial through to the very top of the pyramid, you have systematic reviews because that's synthesizing all the knowledge across the whole body of evidence in an area to make practical clinical recommendations guidelines. That's why they're kind of considered the gold standard and they're used by the World Health Organization. They're used by U UK's NICE system. They're, they're used to inform formularies. They're really the best practice. So let me give you three quick examples so you can make some decisions for yourself based on your own resources and constraints. So I had Dr. Novotny, who was a psychiatrist who was very interested in medical marijuana and how that was interacting um, psychiatrically with his patients, we decided ultimately to do a systematic review because he was a little bit of an exploratory phase. He had some ideas and he had in mind to do future publications, but this was going to give him kind of confidence, a grounding in the state of the art of the evidence, while at the same time help kind of rolling out the red carpet for the next papers that he wanted to do. And this got him from novice to mastery in a very short period of time. Second, we had Dr. Mahmoud, who was a cardiologist, and he actually had some clinical data from his practice that we took a look at together. And we realized that there were some untapped insights just with a few clever tweaks to the design to have it fit in a natural experiment space that kind of is like a pragmatic trial, but didn't have to then go through a long, complicated IRB, Institutional Review Board approval process. Um, he also didn't have the stat skills, so we were able to partner up and help empower that component and co actually we co-authored on that paper together. So again, if you have some of that rich data, um, it could be with us, but I do recommend that you find then a team to help you leverage those insights. And you'll need to follow also step three of this roadmap, which I'm going to come to in a second. The third example that I want to give you actually was from a hospital administrator who set up a clinical trial. Um, he was particularly interested in medical decision making. He ran some hospitals in Sweden, and a, basically what we were able to do was implement a pragmatic trial to where we could study how doctors interface with AI tools to optimize their decision making and some of the problems that they had in doing so, revealing some problems around false confirmation and some blind trust in the AI, which was really kind of surprising and neither of us really had expected at the outset. But I just give you these three examples that illustrates that it's important for you to start with where you are and maybe not where you want to be in a distant future that you might not reach, remembering that this is a journey. And so let's start with the skills that you've got. And if you're at the baseline, you haven't done research before, I'm probably going to 90% of the time recommend that you start with a systematic review. But if you do have some other resources in your wheelhouse, take advantage of those resources and see how you can best leverage them. And some of those resources might be hidden to you. You might have some trainees who are working with you and for you. And if you can plug them into a coherent publishing system, you might be able to churn out a ton of papers fast. Anyway, take a moment, step two, publication roadmap, and write out what your resources and constraints are. And don't forget too, if your constraints are time, maybe you only have one hour a week, maybe two hours a week, you're probably not going to be able to do a clinical trial again. So be realistic with what you've got and then formulate a strategy that fits with that. And that's going to lead you into step three. So step three, we now need to start getting a bit more concrete. We kind of got the fundamentals of your publication roadmap in place. And sometimes, have you ever gone on Google Map and it's kind of like sometimes it's loading. Maybe it's just my loading speed being uh, based in Italy a lot of the time. And it's like really fuzzy. And then suddenly it starts to get, you can start to see the roads and the outline even of where the buildings are. That's kind of a bit where we're going on this roadmap. We have this fuzzy vision. We started with where we want to go and now we're starting to color in some of the details. So now we're going to get a, a little bit more specific. We're going to get to the idea generation stage. And so here's where we need to take sometimes what I see a, a lot of doctors I work with um, having just kind of a theme, an area like Dr. Bakla earlier, who knew she wanted to do things on long COVID and diabetes. And we need to chisel that and convert that into a niche. 
So the first thing that you need to do in your roadmap is you need to look for nearest neighbor papers. So we call nearest neighbor papers that are the paper that is closest to yours. You need to kind of forensically go in the literature and try to find this one or two sets of nearest neighbor papers, not least because you need to make sure you're not duplicating something that's already been done. Believe me, it happens. I've had doctors come to me with their manuscript. This is well and great. It's fantastic. And it's actually dead on arrival because it's duplicating what somebody did or they got scooped. This is especially common in hot areas. I saw this happen a lot around COVID. But um, do your due diligence and check for a nearest neighbor paper. That's also going to help you figure out if there's activity in your space. A common challenge I see with doctors generating ideas is they're just way too narrow. And it's because they're in the in the clinics, in the trenches, and their insights might be very practical and operational for a very, very niche specialized audience. But journals are often appealing, especially the higher impact ones, are trying to appeal to the entire medical community. So as you shrink down that niche area, it, it can actually get harder and harder to publish in a medical journal. So there is some calibration to be done there. One thing I also uh recommend that you do is what we call mini research bites. So um, start taking notes. You can voice dictate these notes. And just when you get a burst of insight or, or, or flash, uh, take these, capture them. And, and over time of registering them, you will have a repository of rich ideas. And you may lose sight of them if you don't take them down. I, I do this old fashioned way. I, I write them down uh, before bed uh, on a notepad, but you're busy in the clinic. And that's sometimes where you can have inspiration hit. Later on, you can use AI tools. Like uh, I'm not going to share with you all of our best tools that we use for this validation exercise. I keep those intentionally for our inner circle members. One tool that you can use that's accessible and available to you is, is simply uh, AI, or even better yet, the fast track AI flavor of it that will help you go through a process using a Pico model to take your idea and turn it into a well-defined topic idea for a medical journal. And the Pico model is going to force you to define the population, the intervention, the comparison group, and the outcome. And you're going to need this Pico model whether you're doing a systematic review or you're doing a clinical trial. These are kind of bread and butter, nuts and bolts of a well-defined topic in uh, medicine. The final thing you need in this validation step of your idea is you need just, again, need to test the waters and forecast your impact. The simplest way to do this is to go into Google Scholar and search around your topic and look at the citations that are there. If you're seeing one to three citations of papers or not finding many papers at all before the Google Scholar search starts going off topic into other fields, then you know there's not really a lively discussion or debate going on in your area. On the flip side, if you start seeing thousands, uh, you, lots of citations, that's a sign that you've got a healthy debate, healthy area of activity. Sometimes it is actually better to swim in a big pond, to be a little fish in a big pond. And being a big fish in a small pond is not necessarily the best thing you want to do for publishing. Again, this is going to depend on ultimately what your career goals are and what you're hoping to achieve. And you, you need that publication strategy that you set out in step one to start syncing with your idea generation strategy here in step three, making sure that you know it's not blocked by the resources that and constraints that you might have in step two. Finally, we come to step four where you need a personalized writing system. And you need a writing system that works with how you think. Look, the reality is you're probably not gonna go back to graduate school and have the time to invest in deep detailed training, hunt around on YouTube for a mishmash of videos that may or may not work for your field or your special subfield where you're at. You, you just don't have time for all that. Um, so there's a few things you can do that are really gonna help your writing in sync with where you're at right now. Again, your daily clinical practice does not involve writing. Whereas if you're a PhD student, you're writing every single day. It's like any skill. If I play basketball every day and you never play, I'm going to dunk all over you on court. It's just not a fair comparison. So let's flip that and let's instead play to your strength. And that is quick notes. So the doctors I work with, uh, their personalized writing system almost always involves voice dictation. It doesn't have to in your case. We can You can still work in the traditional way, but AI now makes voice dictation a heck of a lot better. I would not have recommended this a decade ago, but as new systems change, technology comes out, I'm going to keep recommending the most updated way for you to get the best result in the fastest way possible in an ethical way. So what I recommend you do is use Dragon, other voice dictation software. Um, there's also other tools like Otter AI. I'm not going to go fully into those in those videos. I've got other trainings that get into it. And again, the best ones are in our inner circle program. But suppose you're starting with Dragon, you will get some messy notes and a draft. You can later use then Grammarly, which is 100% free, or even the free version of ChatGPT with 
with the right prompt engineering to keep things ethical, don't want you to get in hot water, to clean up the grammar and start threading those into an outline. The other thing that's going to make this a whole lot easier is instead of trying to do the whole paper in a voice note, is to go section by section following templates. And I put down here in a link below a template for a systematic review because what's great about publishing medical journals is it's really quite formulaic. So if you look in the discussion section of a paper, you're almost always going to follow the same structure. For example, the top part of the discussion, you're going to recap the main findings, then you're going to go into study limitations, then you are going to go into strengths, then you're going to go into coherence with existing studies, then you're going to go into the, I mean, I can say this from memory because I've done it so many times, and you're going to go into uh, what are the implications uh, for future research, and then finally, what are the implications for clinical practice and policy, if any? Um, again, these templates mean you can almost be on autopilot and do this, but that's really helpful for you if you're going to voice dictate a note to set out what the limitations are and then clean it up on the back end with some of the best AI tools available uh, that are going to make everything really, really sutured and smoothed out for academic writing, specifically targeted to the journal that you step set out in the earlier step three of the process based on your nearest neighbor papers that you're going to want to hit. And I hope you can see that these steps are mutually reinforcing. And if our roadmap was really fuzzy at first, we're starting to really clarify some of the details of where you're at. Other thing I want to mention is inside our templates, we also use a peer system. And I come and say, if you give me five minutes of your life, I'm going to get you on the path to being a great writer. Check out this video above. I always want on this channel to equip you with the skills to feel really confident about your writing. And this is the peer system is going to give you the effective anatomy of good writing. And just to give you one nugget of the peer system, then you can go watch the rest of the training. Each paragraph should make one point, and that point should be the first sentence of the paragraph. And you'll see in really good medical writing, probably writing you didn't even notice subconsciously, you just found really easy to di digest and go through, is that you could just skip from paragraph to paragraph and follow what was being said easily. So peer system, it will transform your writing. It's going to take one of the most difficult parts that doctors struggle with and turn it into something that's simple, easy, and clear. Finally, let me just say, if you'd like somebody to work alongside you uh, on your own personal publication roadmap, do get in touch. I see a lot of doctors hiring freelance medical writers, which are hugely expensive. And not only that, it's a one-off. It leaves you feeling a little bit inconfident and always feeling a little bit like a fraud because you hired somebody to do it for you. Instead, invest in yourself and the skills that you will benefit from, from for a lifetime. Having the superpower to plant a flag, publish in the journal of your choosing, and establish yourself as a world-leading expert, that's, that's priceless. If you liked this video, don't forget to subscribe for more content like this. Click a link below. Let's have a chat, see if you're a good fit for our inner circle program, and I will see you in the next video.